Hi, Cam. Hey, Mike. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I heard something. Uh, um, so, today... Yeah, we've got an we've got an interview. You have an interview. Yeah, I wasn't here. Well, <laughs> sorry. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm leaving. Sorry about it. I'm uh, not gonna do this interview. Hold no, on. this is weird. Yeah, we're in a uh, space time, time continuum. You know, uh, you issue. were gone. I was gone. Yes. You did this interview with Spencer Syme. Syme, who uh, was part of the Advantage. Yes, he, he he played guitar he played. in a still. I think Hell is an ongoing thing. So okay. he plays guitar in a band called Hella. And this is part of our ongoing coverage of video game music. Yeah, because the advantage was is a video game music cover thing. They okay. put out albums in oh four and oh six, okay. and he kind of talked like there might be more in the future. So oh. that's exciting. Oh. Here, he said the ultimate goal for the advantage was to cover every single NES track. <laughs> I think they've they've just sort of scratched the surface on that, but what they have done is glorious. Okay. And, um, and you sat down with them. Yeah, I I had a uh, an, a pretty hard nerd moment. I think in the beginning, I'm, you can kind of hear my breathlessness. <laughs> Spencer, I was I was slobbering a little bit, but um, it it turned out good. He he was a very chatty guy. Good. And um, super nice, and I'm so glad we had him on the show. Well, good. Well, then this is episode 46. 46. Of We're Gonna Need a Bigger Show with Cameron and Spencer Syme. So, enjoy. Enjoy. We're gonna need a big show. We're gonna need a bigger, 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 bigger. We're gonna need a big show. We're gonna need a big show. With Mike, Cam, and guests. So, um, yeah, how you doing today? Uh, very good. Thanks. How about yourself? Pretty good. Um, so specifically, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, kind of an ongoing obsession I've had in my life, and that's video game music. And you seemed you seemed like the perfect candidate because, first of all, um, Hella has a few a few chip tune elements. It's not like the I wouldn't say the main element in any in any way, but it's definitely present. And then of course uh, the advantage, which is uh heads and shoulders my favorite video game music cover project so um first of all just thanks for (laughs) thanks for uh being in the advantage i mean it's just it's brought it's brought a lot of joy to my life as i'm sure it has a lot of other people so awesome well i'd like to thank those guys for letting me play in the advantage also (laughs) sure all right well um I always find that the best place to start is the beginning. So, what's what's your history with with gaming, and how does that tie into the the musical part of it? History with gaming. Um, well, I mean, the first real system that I had was the first Nintendo. Um, I know my dad found a a tabletop version of Pong early on when I was a kid. So, you know, well before Nintendo, we had, like, in the garage, a little tabletop, you know, where you can set your drink on the screen and play Pong with up to four people, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was the first video game in the house, aside from random, you know, early computer games and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, first Nintendo system. Um, I mean, everybody, everybody I knew was you know, heavily into it. So there's a lot of game trading going on at school and, you know, loans and, you know, people, uh, yeah, a lot of talk about video games for sure because everybody was, you know, when new games would come out, everybody was uh, either not struggling or heavily struggling with whatever whatever the most uh, current game was that um, everybody was trying to get through. So there's a lot of talk about different levels and techniques and all that good stuff. So, do you remember a specific game or a specific track from a game, music-wise, that really that made an impact on you, even as a kid? Oh, well, I mean, there there were, there were a ton. I mean, um, I remember the game Game Boy. Uh, I think the first Mario Brothers. I remember being really stoked on the ending song from that. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't looked it up since, but there there was a few a few end songs of some of the games that I definitely remember uh, recording with one of those little mini cassette recorders, um, just so that I could listen to them at other times. Because the only other way to listen to it is that one time that it plays when you beat the game, you know. So I I remember I remember certain certain levels, as I'm sure you remember, would allow you 
to pause and the music would stay the same. Or you could find a, a little hidden place where you could stand without getting killed by something. Yeah. Um, or you could just sit and listen to the music if you want to or record it so that you, you know, then not have to play an hour's worth of video games to get to a level to hear this music, you know. So, um, I mean, the music was powerful enough to me to where, like, I, I really wanted to... Uh, um, listened to it and it did something to me so um, it, you know I definitely remember the music having a big impact on me and then later in life realizing how amazingly created and, and um, uh, arranged that stuff was that it was, that it could not only be such um, such a cool tune to listen to but that your brain wouldn't get tired of hearing it over and over so it's got to be really good in that respect can you as as a kid can you put your finger on what what was special about this music to you like was it was it associated with the gameplay itself um did you experience that music differently than you would say you know music that was made for music's sake like you know any other band well i mean some of the music you could tell they were trying to make it sound like a rock band mm-hmm. so as much as they could with the um you know the the prehistoric uh, machinery they're working with to to uh to compose this stuff on but um i don't know i guess the stuff that really stood out to me was just a lot of these really beautiful like kind of triumphant harmonies that would come in and you could for you know for a kid's brain i wasn't yet um into playing music and so for a kid's brain being able to hear these harmonies that are just like a two-part or maybe in some places you know a three-part harmony with the bass um you know you you, you can actually understand how they're creating because you can hear them all working individually and usually when you hear music that's like that you know any type of classical or something that has really kind of amazing uh, symphonic stuff going on. It's a little too complicated to really comprehend unless you are a musician and can pick the stuff out. But as a kid, that stuff really stood out to me. And then also the the weirder time signature stuff just um, grabbed my attention a lot more than everything else. And that was from my early age, I remember. As you got older and you started composing your own music, I'm assuming in your teens or so, do you think um, this kind of music had any influence on how you played and composed? Well, I mean, probably. I mean, I didn't. I I didn't really get into. I mean, my first band or so was probably. You know, there'd be more parts that were kind of just staccato. You know, plain plain parts that were um, more. Yeah, I guess more staccato and just going through one single melody line rather than using multiple notes at the same time or chords yeah. like that. But I think for the most part, I didn't start composing music like that, but I know that it had an impact on me just as far as um, probably more melodically than anything else rather than, um, you know, the composition style. So fast forward a little bit to Hella, um, and particularly there's... There's an intro track, uh, let's see, the title is from uh, Hold Your Horses, uh, D. Elkin. Um, was that the first time you had tried something like that, or was that um, just a continuation of other things you had already done? That song was probably something I'd made at least, at least two or three years previous to that. Um, I bought my first computer ever off of Forrest Harding, who was the original guitar player in the Advantage. Um, at the time, the band was called Generic. And, um, yeah, yeah, so I bought the, this off him, mainly just because him and uh, Nick Rogers, the other original guitar player, um, were both really into Impulse Tracker, mm-hmm. uh, which was a DOS-based uh tracker sequencer program and um i i just loved the stuff they're making on it really wanted to, to do that and obviously the only way to do it is with a um an old pc which even at the time it was pretty old i think mine had had like 120 120 gig or 120 meg hard drive yeah, yeah. and um but you know i i was able to learn that program from them and then just start you know, doing stuff, and that was still, I was still in high school, probably late junior, early senior year, and then started Hella a year or two after that, and so, um, so yeah, some of the tracks that make their way onto the Hella stuff, I think just 
were tracks that I had either created a year or two before or that I was creating for that um, record or that scenario. And, um, you know, just kind of, they, they worked kind of good as, as uh, interludes and, um, you know, it's just another form of creating music that I could apply to, a, you know, an album that we're putting out. Sure. And um, the first Hella song I ever heard, and you may have to help me with the title, so I apologize. It's something like Madonna Approaches R&B Rex. Yeah, R&B Blonde Wreckages. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, so I would say that one definitely has some heavy kind of chip tune stuff going on. It it made a huge impact on me because it was, I just never heard anything like it. And I'm I'm certain you've had other people tell you something similar to that. So I'm wondering when you first started integrating kind of 8-bit sounds, chip tune kind of stuff, what was the initial reaction from fans, people who already knew the band, or maybe that was their introduction to the band? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I've never had anybody tell me that the first Hella song they've ever heard was um, one of the more electronic ones, even though I'm sure that's the case, but mm-hmm. maybe, maybe nobody's ever told me about it, so I haven't... Um, I don't know. That'd be weird. It'd be weird to hear the uh, uh, Madonna song um, as your first um yeah as your as your first uh listening experience i can't confirm that it was weird but in the best kind of way so well i mean it yeah i mean it, it yeah i don't really know what to say i mean I, I would assume people liked it i mean we we had a record that was all impulse tracker and drums only um and that record seemed to do pretty well, and people like that one. It's definitely in my, you know, top couple Hella records. I really like that record a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so that was like an earlier, well, earlier version as far as uh, re- professional recording goes. Um, an early version of Impulse Tracker meets uh, Hella. <laughs> sure. Um, but that that record was called Total Bugs Bunny on Wild Bass. Yeah. So um, that was the first full album we did. But before that, like I said, it was just scattered tracks throughout different Hella stuff. So that was the only electronic music program I've used to write music on so far. (laughs) I don't remember how, but, you know, like this this program is a sequencer slash tracker. So it's you're just importing a wave and the wave is anything, you Mm -hmm. know, like it. You could make your own waves where, you know, sample your own drum set or hit a key on a keyboard or a note on a guitar or whatever and then put it in there. And all it's doing is is pitching it up or down depending on how, you know, how you have it set. So um, the nintendo kind of stuff, all that really is, I mean, the only Nintendo type of sounds I ever had were sounds you would have on any standard um, um you know, early synth, and that is just a triangle wave and square wave. And so um, I had a sample of a square wave and a sample of a triangle wave, and so they're just kind of pitched up and down, you know, to make the melody line. And, you know, certain songs that have more of that in there would probably sound more nintendo y, but they, I guess what I liked about them is that they have this real low, kind of gravelly. Yeah. Um, uh, grit to them that I, I really like and some of the other sounds you know that's what what I kind of got away from music wise you know when, when Nintendo 64 came out is everything really kind of smoothed out and I really felt kind of lost a lot of the life you know not that there's not some great uh, Nintendo 64 songs but I just felt like overall the Nintendo was more aligned with where I was coming from so those early grit sounds were ones that I might use um, more than you know, something that reminded me of Nintendo 64. Sure, I know I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah, it's it's something like Contra or, you know, Castlevania or, you know, any of the stuff that the, that the Advantage covered is kind of worlds away from, you know, Mario 64 or GoldenEye or whatever the game may be, you know. Yeah, so. or Super Nintendo, I guess, is what I was referring to. I said uh, 64, but yeah, that's, that's even an, uh, another step past, you know, obviously, of where it's just it's just wave format music, you know, recorded in a recording studio rather than something programmed, you know, for the most part. Yeah, I gotcha. Now kind of moving over into the, your experience uh, with the Advantage, how did how did that come about? Did you meet people that were already doing it? Um, that seemed to be what you were kind of 
hinting at a minute ago when you mentioned the other members? Well, I I met um, let's see, I met Cassie and Nick in high school. I actually saw them play at like a little talent show in the cafeteria in high school, you know, or like some other. Or, I, I can't remember if it was a talent show or I think it was just like a you know lunchtime performance, and a couple different people got up and they got up and just played a couple of. Uh, Nintendo songs on um, acoustic instruments, if I remember correctly, just, yeah. you know, acoustic bass and acoustic guitar, maybe two acoustic guitars, and um, I had always really wanted to play that music live in a band scenario, but never, I don't know, the people I, were, I was, had played with so far were not really trained in that way, yeah. so I hadn't really become an option yet unless I wanted to play guitar in it, but, um, you know, here were two people that were already... Um, pretty, you know, darn good at that stuff. And so, um, yeah, asked them if they wanted a drummer. And uh, I was just learning how to play drums at that time, but they, you know, seemed stoked on the idea. And so um, started doing that. And then shortly after, um, Forrest joined the band. And then we had, you know, four four members and started to uh, make, make recordings and, and play a few shows locally around Nevada City area, and um, yeah, cool. So, <clears throat> as far as your approach went, like specifically for drums, would you would you meticulously go over the songs and be like, okay, that's kind of a that's kind of a hi hat pattern. I'm going to do this to kind of emulate that, or was it more? I'm going to do what I think <clears throat> they would have done had they had a real drum set. Like, how did you approach what you were going to play on okay. drums? I would say a combination between trying to be as accurate as possible with what was actually played, and then depending on the song, if you know if if it was really simplistic um, to a fault, you know, to, uh, programming originally, then I probably would elaborate it on a little bit and just do what I thought the programmers were kind of going for, um, you know that kind of, for the most part, that's what I would say would happen. And then there are other songs where I probably added, just kind of did my own thing on them, yeah. you know, something that I thought sounded good, but there's, you know, there's some that I definitely tried to, you know, to recreate what, what where they would have liked it to uh, come from originally. Sure. And as far as melodically goes, you know, I know you were on drums, but like, do you think your bandmates had a different approach than that? Do you think, you know... Uh, would would it, either the guitarist or the bass player or whatever been like mm, that that note's uh, actually supposed to be this and it's the rhythm is this you know or or was it kind of a little looser than that nope um their their whole deal was pretty you know 99% spot on to the original recordings or the original um songs so we were able to with a couple of different programs, uh, separate the tracks individually, so that, and then slow them down so they could learn everything exactly note for note. So the only time any of that would change is if the, you know, if the the instrument did some, made some weird little sound on its own that wasn't really melodic, you know, because some of those would. It, some of those tracks would incorporate little noises and things, and so we, you know, would kind of. Um, you know, they would do a lot of, you know, just trying to interpret how, you know, that noise and then try to figure out a way to recreate it on the guitar. And then, like, little slides and things, you know, where it goes way up into some register and back real quick. You know, yeah. you just slide it. You know, there's certain things you can't fully recreate on guitar, but as far as anything in the notation, that was all uh, done exactly the way that the music um, was on the game. I mean, I guess I had the most freedom as far as that stuff is was concerned, um, you know, which was nice to have. And then, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure just, you know, from playing and, and touring and stuff, we would do, you know, the, the games when we first learned them originally started off being very close to the game. And then, I don't know, we would just like fool around with the songs a little bit each night and just, you know, more just make it sound like the Nintendo was crashing you know, rather than really change it, try to make it sound more like metal or sound more like, um, 
like you know it's salsa music or you know try rather than really trying to change the, the style i think we would just do stupid stuff and make it like sound like we were totally terrible which <laughs> i don't i don't really know why i think we just thought it was funny yeah so that actually relates to what i was about to ask you you mentioned making it metal or making it salsa, which to me the the you know covering the tunes, but you know but metal is kind of like that's sort of everybody's go to. Let's let's make it metal. So one of I think the question that's most important to me or the one that I'm most curious about, I guess, is when the band got together, was there a discussion? This is going to be the attitude and sound of the band, or was it just everybody kind of falling into their natural role? I it was. I would say it was just completely natural. I mean, honestly, we were in high school, like kids with no money. Um, everybody had an amp and a cord to plug their guitar into the amp, but no effects or anything like that. So I don't think we even. I think we just started off playing everything very dry, just because we didn't really have the option of anything else. And so then we got used to that. And then, um, I don't know, you know, I think everybody was trying to keep the same mood as the games, but, but, but still doing it on guitar, if that makes any sense. You know, the games have a very staccato, think, think, you know, kind of um, feel to them, so we want to keep that without all the sustain between each note, like you would get if you were doing it in a metal style or with heavier, um, you know, affecting as far as, you know, as far as um, overdrive and stuff like that. So we were trying to keep it more... I don't know, in, in, in line with the, the vibe that we interpreted from the game. So that ended up just being a little drier and less metal. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you were mentioning that as you guys toured and as you played the songs more, it kind of evolved. Um, do you feel like the recordings um, capture you at, at you guys at the beginning of that evolution or at the end or the middle? or? Well, the recordings, we wouldn't really... Well, actually, never mind. I was uh, I was going to say something different. The the recordings do highlight some of that stuff. I mean, you can tell there's like very, you know, the songs playing and everything sounds normal, and then it just like falls apart rhythmically and melodically, and it sounds like everybody just got like, you know, just got roofied. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. It like in in two seconds, and then it'll kind of like fall back into the music, and that's more just. I don't know, it, it, making the song uh, a little, I don't know, feel a little bit different for that moment or whatever. I honestly don't really know why. That was never really like a conscious, totally conscious thing. You know, we just, it just would kind of happen as we were just messing around and, and we kind of liked it. So then, yes, it would work its way onto the recordings sometimes. Yeah, gotcha. And those are, I mean, those are definitely the memorable moments of the album where. <clears throat> You know, you just hear that like kind of stuff, and like sounds like somebody screaming in the background, and it just uh, or kind of a yelping noise or something. And uh, I, I think that it just gave it so much character, you know. So I appreciated it for what it's worth. Is there? We've we've already kind of established that the way the band came out, the way the way the music came out was kind of natural. But do you think that on, at the onset or at any point the band had a particular goal? And do you think that goal was achieved? Well, I mean, I remember at one point, um, I think somewhere, like in an interview or something, we said that we would like to finish, you know, doing our uh, recorded interpretation of all of the songs from the original NES. Now, obviously, that's thousands of songs, yeah. um, so we're not there yet, and we haven't really been active recently, but uh, I think that was really the only goal, is we wanted to get to as many songs as possible, um, because, you know, when we showed up to the, when, I think when everybody showed up to the band, every, you know, at different times, I think we all arrived with a handful of songs that we've just loved forever. So those were like the first and foremost, those are the ones that we would learn and uh, play and record and everything. And then we started uh, just going through all of the different um, 
ROM and NSF files and just, you know, through games that some of us had never even played before and just found that, like, they had an awesome composer or awesome music. And so, uh, you know, some of the songs we've played, you know, I haven't even played that level. Um, you know, songs that we've actually performed, I haven't even played that level in that game. So, um, you know, there's a lot of really cool discovery of songs you've never heard after the fact. Sure, and and it's it's appreciating. I mean, there's nothing wrong with nostalgia, but you're you're appreciating it outside of that. So it's like you can you can really see it for what it is, as opposed to what you want it to be. I guess. Yep. You were talking about people bringing in songs. Uh, what what were you insisting on? Like, I want to. I we have to do this and this and this. Oh, I mean, there. I mean, a bunch of different ones. I mean, there was like. Quite a bit of the Mega Man stuff. I was just totally nerdy over, and so um, Mega Man and Ninja Gaiden for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. There, I know there was a Battle Toad song that Fester's Quest. Um, yeah. Hmm, a couple of the Dungeons and Dragons songs, and actually the um, uh, what's that? With, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards and Warriors too. I mean, I don't know. There was there was a lot. I mean, I think that everybody had some different stuff there, and you know, it's cool because some some of the guys had you know it's kind of a totally different style, and they'd want to do you know like uh, Bomberman and and things that had more of like kind of an upbeat like cartoony kind of vibe. And I guess I was more into like the stuff that was a little bit more uh, either really eerie or rock oriented or something like, but like a death, you know at at the time, Japanese interpretation of uh, American rock music <laughs> or something. Sure. And so it was, it was uh, yeah, I think the, everybody having their own taste and what stuff they were into obviously contributed to a pretty varied uh, library of material once we were, you know, got a couple records under our belt. It, were there any that uh, were brought in that just did not work, like just couldn't make it happen? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely there were a couple or, you know, ones where most of the people were into it, but maybe one guy wasn't or it would make his job insanely hard because, I mean, honestly, I had the easiest role of of anybody in that band. I mean, those guys had to learn so much, you know, it's just a totally different type of brain activity just going note for note at light speed, you know, through all this stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting back just like banging on some drums, you know. I don't know. I mean, I definitely think I had the easiest role there, and um, but there were definitely a few that didn't really work out, or if they did, if they kind of partially worked out, we'd put them on a tour CD or on, you know, a little EP or something, just because, you know, it wouldn't make the cut for the record, but we at least wanted to get it out there, and, you know, we tried. <laughs> sure. So, that being said about, you know, your job as a drummer, could you ever... Could you ever see yourself playing guitar in something like this, or is that just totally not, you know, I mean, obviously you're an experienced guitar player and a great guitar player, but maybe this is not the kind of stuff you would ever see yourself doing? Yeah, I don't I don't really see it. Um, just for my, my approach, I guess, to guitar, I mean, I don't really think of guitar in the way that I think that those guys think of their instrument, you know, because most of these songs were done in standard tuning, except for maybe a couple where they would tune a string down because it made certain certain sweeps or arpeggios easier, you know, not having to jump up to this string each time or whatever, but for the sure. most part, everything's done in standard, so, I mean, most of, the, most of the guitar players I know or have met so far in my life, you know, do most things kind of in a standard tuning, so I would say they have a much better feel for their instrument as a whole than I do. Um, I have a better feel, you know, for myself, um, a better feel for for dynamics and technique rather than for the notation on the instrument because I really, I don't know, I just got used to writing every song, you know, that I w- would write in a completely different tuning. So I don't really have a very good basis for that kind of stuff. So I think it would, it's just not really the way my brain works to sit down and learn a, uh, a musical piece, and that's not to say that I won't change or I won't get into that later on. But I've, I'm not trained musically, so something like that seems kind of a little bit daunting. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I can totally understand that. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about it, but you saying you're in different tunings all the time, well, those notes move all the time. There's no way. But yeah, you just, you just get used to it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I know I could get used to playing everything that those guys are playing. It's just a totally different type of uh, mindset. And it's also, um, you know, I, I mean, I've already been in the Advantage and done what we did over the few-year period, so I guess it's not on my, my top list of things to do to, you know, then start playing music as the guitarist. Um, sure. But I did throughout, you know, some of our EPs and stuff, we would, we had a couple of EPs where we would um, all do our own personal interpretations of the song mm-hmm. and, and record them ourselves and then put them all out on a, you know, a six or seven song EP together. Yes. Um, and so some of those I did, you know, they were kind of fast you know, crazy stuff, and so those I did learn and play all the instruments um, for those, but, you know, I guess just imagining having to, you know, perform 30 of them at any given show or whatever, um, yeah, be a lot of work, so yeah, I guess I'm on to different things now, so I may not, <laughs> may not uh, find myself doing that, but who knows. Gotcha. This is kind of a two-part. Um, was there a song that you guys did that a you feel like is the like the crowning achievement of the advantage like a particular track and is there one that you would cons- you would put in a similar light just drum wise like one that you really feel like you nailed it and it, it turned out well hmm no not specifically um i mean i think i had something I was doing um had had my phone on um, random or shuffle the other day, and Sparkman came on mm-hmm. uh, from Mega Man, and I was I just remember thinking, man, that song rips, and I think we did a really good job at um, at covering that one. So that's definitely one that sticks out to me. Um, Ninja Gaiden, I really like the. Our interpretation of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm just glad we were able to get a lot of these, you know, down and recorded. And I think that, you know, some turned out better than others or whatever, but they all kind of have our, you know, our unique um, interpretation of them on it. And, you know, kind of, it's like the way that we hear it, but in the real world, not stuck in the... Uh, system there you know so I'm, I'm i'm stoked that a lot of those were able to work their way out into a different um realm sure um just from a fan's point of view um i would say that the ones that i enjoy the most are uh ducktales um i would assume i'm not the only one there that's it's that one's considered I mean, just doing a little bit of research on the internet or whatever, that one seems to be the one that's, there's a consensus that that is a, it's, it's a great track, you know, in its original format. But I remember that being like one of the first ones I heard from the advantage. And I just, I played it over and over and over and over. And it just made me feel like, it just made me feel good. I don't know how else to put it. It's a very feel good song. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then the other one being, um, I would, there's like, there's two different versions of the Contra boss music, uh, at least on the records that I have. And, um, the, the one on Elf titled, I don't know if it's redone or just sped up a little bit, but, um, that's one of those ones that I, I just, when it gets to that kind of climactic, uh, harmonized part towards the end, it just, I get chills every time. It's amazing. Um, totally. Me too, and that that was that's actually one of the first ones before I even met any of those guys. We actually started fooling with learning it in um, the first band that I was in. Um, never really got all the way through it, but that was like my top top. You know, as far as here's one to start with, even though it's obviously not the easiest one to start with. It's the one that I wanted to start with. Contra Boss music. I mean, I've got one more question here, and it's one of those ones. It's you know, it's hard to answer, but. Um, the video game music and specifically stuff from the uh, NES era, um, do you think it has value outside of, you know, just the, out of, outside of nostalgia and what, what do you think the value is? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think it has a huge value out of, um, 
nostalgia, um, and it's, I mean, I would say in, because it inspires people to do other things that maybe are similar in mood. I mean, I've definitely done a lot of things that I felt kind of aligned with, you know, how music, how video game music made me feel. So I was able to create other music that made me feel like that too, but, you know, of my own creation. So I think just maybe inspiring people to do, um, other things. And then, um, from a production standpoint, obviously we've seen a lot, especially in the last like two years in popular music. Um, I mean, there's all these huge video game references coming in and all the melody lines are like these, you know, square and triangle waves. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of coming out of the whole like dubstep turning into or like working its way into popular music. And now it's very, you know, just a lot of the club and dance music is all, uh, starting to become video game inspired so that's kind of a weird thing to see yeah. uh, happen as well so um, I would say from an inspiration standpoint that's um, the biggest um, important role I think it's had at least for me you had mentioned that you know there were no immediate plans for anything advantage wise but does that mean that there there may be something in the future um Sure. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why something couldn't happen again. I mean, it's, you know, we, the advantage is always a side thing that we all get on top of our, our um, I don't want to say real, but I guess more, um, you know, our projects that had uh, more musical outlet and were more kind of our bread and bar- butter as far as our own creation. So those were always those always took first priority and the advantage was something that we did and toured um, in between tours with other bands but it actually worked out good we were able to do a good you know couples US tours a year and you know Japan and Korea sometimes and you know things like that which was um, great so when we when we kind of stopped playing there was about a two year break and then I remember we got a call to do um, Japan and Korea and so we went out and did that and then didn't really do anything after that. You know, it's just kind of, I don't know, stuff. if something comes up or we get offered the right thing and everybody's uh, into it, I could definitely see it happening again. Okay. Did you feel like the reception in Japan and Korea was different in any way than it was here? Well, you know, not a whole lot, actually. That was, that was the kind of um, refreshing thing about touring the States with the Advantage is that people would kind of, like, lose their mind over it. I think the nostalgia would take over, and they would, they would forget that they're in some, like, hip, like, club environment where they're usually supposed to just stand there and kind of nod their head and look cool. They would, like, become total nutballs and, like, run around and just get like crazy into it and that, that was the that was always a, a nice um refreshing thing compared to some of the other bands i've played and even if even though we were you know uh had a you know people there to see us you know it's just a totally different vibe and japan was always you know the crowd is very receptive to the music they're music lovers they're really amazing um people to have watching you perform so it was kind of the same um, between the U S and Japan actually, which it, I couldn't say that for the other bands. The U S was a little lackluster compared to Japan for the other projects, but the advantage worked well in both, you know, in front of both crowds. That's interesting. They're both instrumental music, but I, I mean, in, at least in terms of hello, which was mostly instrumental, but, um, yeah, I mean, was that the, uh, this is sort of a side question that I may edit out, but, um, was that the whole point of concentration phase? Was to kind of show that? Um, I don't know. I think it was just to to, to highlight um, Japan and how amazing of a place it is, and um, you know, especially in the music realm and how the people there are not are not um, held up with all these you know stupid social rules and. Um, you know, at least as far as music goes. I don't know, they, the, the Japanese are, have always really in, inspired me. You go over there and you play, you know, with two or three different bands every night, and they all totally rip. And in the States, you might do a whole six-week tour and maybe have one or two bands. You're like, wow, those guys were really good. 
Um, and that, I hope I don't sound jaded by that. It's just like, you know, you, obviously we have specific, we all have specific tastes in music, and you could go through a lot of bands before you find one, and you're like, wow, that really, um, you know, that really sounds good to me. And over there, it's like, you're just like really practice, and I bet, I guess at the, at the base of it, just have a ton of soul where I, we don't see that as much over here. It's kind of few and far between. So I think that that movie is just kind of hopefully showcasing that a bit and, uh, you know, just showing the everything everything about <laughs> what it's like to tour over there. So rewinding just a little bit, uh, you said that, you know, people were, you know, in America as well, were much more likely to kind of forget themselves and go crazy during an Advantage show. Was there any particular song that really brought that out that you remember? Um, probably Death Kettles for sure. Um, Goonies 2 is also kind of a similar feeling song. You know, it was kind of very triumphant, uplifting, you know, upbeat. Sure. Um, those were two that really stand out to me where people feel pretty nuts. Yeah, when you mentioned that you had to get this program in order to, or the guitarist and the bass player, I guess, had to get the program to separate the tracks and kind of figure out who was playing what, the Goonies was the first thing that came to mind because it's like, it, that's one that I've also just played on loop and just tried to be like, okay, this time I'm going to concentrate on just that one guitar and I can't. Like, it, it eventually just kind of, they kind of like, meld into each other and you can't tell what's what anymore and that's part of the beauty of it yep yeah it would make our work a lot harder and i think we before we found out about these programs we would do that just slow it down and cut each note out and each note is a harmony and then we'd figure out what both those notes were and then we'd figure out which guitar to send that note to you know based on where it's already at on the neck and trying to make it as easy as possible so you're not trading notes back and forth where each guitar player is having to go up and down the neck like crazy you know just trying to keep within the realm of where their fingers are already at so yeah winamp winamp and uh nose fart plug-in were the two uh saving grace for that band for sure nose fart huh yep all right. I'll, um, I mean, I would say I'm going to write that down, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to remember it. Spencer, um, thank you so much for, for taking your time with me. This has been very enlightening. Um, it's been great to just sort of fan out and, and just have a chance to, to tell you on, on behalf of a, a lot of people, I'm sure, uh, how much we appreciate uh, you know, what, what you and your bandmates have done musically. So um, hopefully you'll pass that on if they're not listening to this. And if they are, thank you. And um, I just want to thank you again for taking some time with me. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate it very much. Yeah, for We're Gonna Need a Bigger Show, this has been uh, Cameron B. Childs and my guest. Spencer's time. And uh, signing off. We'll see you all next time. Bring it away.